This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 437 was produced on July 18th, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. New York Times best-selling author Lynn Alden returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss a smorgasbord of topics ranging from inflation to interest rates to advanced nuclear reactors and the role the AI data center crowd might play in fast-tracking their development and commercialization. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, July 17th, 2024. The S&P 500 September futures were down 86 basis points to 56.39. Wednesday saw the first big reversal day in months, but is it the start of something bigger? We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index down 118 basis points to 103.74 broken its key support with big moves in both the euro and the yen. The September WTI crude oil contract up 46 basis points, trading at 81.44. We'll take a look at that chart in the post game, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The September RBOB gasoline down 160 basis points, trading at 246. The August gold contract up 336 basis points, trading at 24.59. A breakout to all time new highs. Copper, down 435 basis points, trading to 440 at a critical support level. And uranium, down 134 basis points to 84.80. The U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, down 13 basis points, trading at 416 as bonds continue to strengthen. The key news to watch next week is we have the flash manufacturing and services PMIs, Bank of Canada monetary policy statement, and the core PCE price index. This week's feature interview guest is New York Times bestselling author Lynn Alden to discuss the economic outlook, energy, gold, rates, and more. Eric's interview with Lynn Alden is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Lynn, it's great to get you back on. It's been so long. Lynn, let's start with what you've been writing about this week, which is the way the market has been conditioned to rate hikes and rate cuts. What's your outlook? Right. So in the the past cycle, we have kind of seen uh, firsthand that the economy was more resilient to rate hikes than many would have expected, Um, basically with the federal government having fairly short duration debt and most parts of the private sector having pretty long duration debt that's fixed. The economy was relatively resilient as rate hikes occurred. The deficits got way larger, uh, which in some cases can be stimulatory uh, for the industries that are on the receiving side of those deficits and all that interest expense. And you know, mortgages and corporate debt, a lot of that was shielded from that higher rate for quite a while. And so one of the things I've been analyzing is to determine if that's going to be the case on the other side of this as well. If the U.S. economy is going to be more desensitized to rate cuts than it normally has been and relative to other countries. So from an American perspective, you know, not a lot of Americans realize that in other countries, homeowners, for example, are less likely to have, at, there's, there's like a lower ratio of fixed rate, long duration debt tied to housing in other countries. And so they can be more sensitive to interest rates on the up or down cycle. And so this was kind of a perfect storm for the U.S. being more resilient against rate hikes. And I think we could see the other, the other side of this uh, on the cutting cycle. 
I want to integrate this view that you have with some of my own views and, and get your reaction. I've felt for quite a while now, like secular inflation is back. Most people are in denial about it. And there's a, a point of reckoning coming for the market when people finally realize, wait a minute, th- this attitude people have had of all oh, these crazy high mortgage rates, you know, they'll come back down soon enough. Maybe they're not coming back down. Maybe what was crazy was the low mortgage rates and maybe that's over now and not going to come back. I felt like the market just hadn't absorbed that reality yet. Are you saying that they are beginning to absorb it or are you really saying something different that doesn't lead to that conclusion? So I think what I'm pointing out is that um, even if you get moderately lower interest rates, um, that's not particularly stimul- stimulative. And so, for example, if you know if I were to guess what are mortgages, what are, what are the yields going to look like two years from now, I would say probably lower than they are now, but not as low as the market's been accustomed to. And so basically, this was the first cycle in a long time where we had higher uh, highs in terms of interest rates. So for 40 years, it was like lower lows and lower highs. We got the higher high uh, for the first time in a long time. And my expectation uh, for a variety of reasons, the fiscal dominance, the secular inflation backdrop, all these other factors, I think we're going to have a higher low in interest rates, both short duration rates and in longer duration rates. And that has a number of effects on the economy. So for example, there won't be many mortgages to refinance to lower rates if we don't get a lower low uh, in mortgage rates. And so I think that that's, that's a base case that I'm going to expect and that, that basically limits some of the effectiveness of rate cuts. In addition, the corporate sector, a lot of the debt's already locked in at low rates. So even if even if investment-grade corporate bond yields come back down moderately, it doesn't really open a lot of stimulus uh, aspects. It only really affects some of the shorter duration or more rate-sensitive areas. And it potentially has bigger impacts for, you say, emerging markets because they've, they've obviously been pressured from tight monetary policy and their dollar-denominated debt. And so if you do get a, a softening of U.S. economic data, and you do get some rate cuts in response to that, it's quite possible that it wouldn't be very stimulatory at all for the U.S. economy, and yet it would release some of the burden uh, in in forward markets. Uh, So basically, I think that this cycle could work a little bit differently than we've been accustomed to in past cutting cycles. Now, you're still speaking in the future tense when you describe this higher low in interest rates. You're talking about it's still coming. What about the possibility that it's already come and gone, that we've already seen the low in interest rates and that there are no cuts coming? It's it's all hikes from here. Just had, The market hasn't absorbed that reality yet. Would that be consistent with your outlook? And, and if so, what would it mean? Well, sure. That'd be a more that'd be a more extreme version uh, of the outlook. And so, right now, both the the way that the Fed's pointing uh, and the market's positioning, they're expecting some mild cuts later this year uh, and into next year. Obviously, that can change with any given month or quarter of economic data. Some of the recent data has been on the softer side. So, yeah, my base case is that we get some cuts and that, and that we see a little bit lower uh, in, say, short-term rates and then probably also part, parts of the curve. If that ends up not being the case at all, and if we actually just, you know, we, we've already bottomed in terms of rates and head higher, then everything I said would basically be amplified with the exception that it means that there'd probably still be a lot of negative pressure on dollar-denominated debts in emerging markets. So that's, that's the big variable that would change, I think, if we see, you know, that the highs aren't even in, in terms of interest rates. Well, that's where I think that we're headed, Lynn, but of course, that's just one person's view. I also want to touch briefly on the events of this past weekend with respect to the assassination attempt on uh, President Trump. What are your what's your take on how that is going to affect markets, the economic cycle, election cycle and everything else? Sure. So, I mean, obviously, that was a that was a tragic and and generational news event. So it's always tricky to then just talk about how it's going to have financial impacts. But that's what we're here to do. You know, basically, when we look at say betting markets on the upcoming election, they were favorable for Trump uh, in that regard. And so that's basically one of the takeaways. Uh, I think is that as investors and as market participants, we we change the expectations a little bit around pricing. I don't think it has that much of an impact in the sense that betting markets and polls were already slightly leaning toward him anyway. And so it just solidified something that was already kind of being priced in. Generally speaking, it has a couple of different ramifications. Uh, one is that him and his uh, today, it was his new, newly announced uh, running mate, J.D. Vance, they both have currently, say, 
pro crypto views, pro Bitcoin, pro crypto. So that affects that industry compared to the alternative. We also can pay attention to some of the um, prior tax cuts of Trump's prior administration. Some of those are set to expire uh, in the next term. And whether or not those will be allowed to expire or whether they'll be uh, extended or made permanent, you know, will largely be affected by the election outcome. Uh, and so overall, I would say the digital asset industry has is, is priced this in favorably. And then overall markets uh, seem to probably view it as somewhat stimulatory because all us being equal, we can, we can probably expect larger deficits because you, the idea of tax hikes is uh, minimized, uh, as well as uh, kind of the regulatory stance that we can expect. So overall, for, for multiple asset classes, I think that they've rationally priced in a little bit of a bump, but that it's not that different from what they were already pricing before this event. Now, I'm fascinated specifically by the angle about both former President Trump and his new running mate being pro-crypto. What I think is actually more interesting is that they're anti-CBDC. They they don't want to allow the creation of a U.S. government CBDC. To me, that's even more relevant than whether they do or don't support Bitcoin. What's your take on that? I think that's relevant as well. Um, I think that in the United States, given all the different moving parts between the central bank uh, and the government, that that was not likely a near-term outcome anyway. But that does obviously further reduce the odds of anything like that happening. Another kind of interesting position of Vance is that he has expressed the view that you'd normally hear from someone like Luke Groman about how the, the way that the dollar system is currently structured hollows out the industrial base. But that's not something you normally hear from politicians uh, it, it's something that you know some financial analysts have pointed out, the whole dollar Dutch disease or uh, the Triffin dilemma. There's multiple ways to kind of phrase it or describe it. Um, but basically, by having so much demand for dollars globally, it strengthens the dollar. It increases our import power, decreases our export competitiveness, which has the most impact on lower margin uh, and physical industries. And so that's something that he has talked about. So yeah, whether you look at Bitcoin, the broader kind of crypto security space uh, or CBDCs or even even the role of the of the dollar itself uh, in its current form all of those positions uh, uh, in that administration obviously lean a certain way compared to the other administration so and all of that got repriced partially from this event I want to go back to the repricing of markets and specifically the outlook for interest rates, because my sense of it is markets are still discounting an expectation of some kind of campaign of cuts, not just one cut, but multiple cuts over you know a period of several months and several meetings. I don't think that the market has really priced the possibility that there's either just one token cut, which I, I think the, is something that is quite likely the Fed might do just to save face because they've set this expectation that cuts were coming. But it seems to me like we're in a situation where the only reason for the Fed to cut is to fulfill an expectation that they set previously, and there might not be any cuts at all. Do you think the market has even begun to price that scenario? And if it did start to price that scenario of no cuts at all, what would it look like for equities? So I think that'd be negative for both equities and bond markets. Partially would depend on what catalyst changed it. You know, right now, for example, some of the data has been soft. The Fed, so it's not just what the Fed is saying; it's 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 the data coming in, and then the Fed responding to that data. You know, various Fed officials talking about those prints that have come in, whether for inflation, whether for economic data, these slightly softening labor market. So, yeah, basically, right now, uh, the market is pricing in some cuts by the end of this year, let alone into next year. Not having any cuts would be outside of my base case as well. But if we do get that scenario, I do think it would probably see pressure in the banking system, uh, or at least bank stocks, pressure among valuations uh, of equities. If the reason was strong economic growth, uh, if, there, if basically if there were various prints that came in in that direction that kind of hold off the likelihood of cuts, that could at least be seen as constructive for stock earnings. Probably the worst case scenario would just be uh, uptick in CPI data, because at that point you'd have kind of 
you know, no necessarily improvement to corporate earnings, but you'd have an expectation of higher for longer interest rates, which would keep downward pressure on their valuations. Um, so yeah, if, if the scenario that you describe comes, that basically everything turns out more hawkish than the market expects, both in terms of um, inflation data coming in hot or economic, you know, nominal economic data coming in hot and the overall kind of mild cuts being priced out of the market, that would be troubling for a lot of asset prices. And sentiment's pretty high, Volatility is pretty low. There's a lot of capital piled into equities. And so I, I do think there'd be a pretty significant risk at that point of, of a correction. Let's talk about the level of these equity markets just to start with. I mean, we talk about a wall of worry. First, a whole bunch of really smart people said, you know, we, we, the, the bottom's not in for the the bear market. There's still going to be a new lower low. That turned out to be wrong. And then we've just seen one, you know, one more high after another. Is this market overvalued and is it waiting for a catalyst to bring on a correction? And why haven't we seen one sooner? So I think there are there are pockets of, of it being overvalued. If you look at kind of a median stock, the median stock's not particularly expensive. You know, their growth rates aren't particularly great either, but they're not particularly expensive. A lot of the valuation excesses are consolidated in kind of a handful of um, company types. Generally things that are are, you know, not just mega cap tech, but basically any sort of like low volatility growth is generally where you see valuation excesses. So even even stocks like Costco, for example, despite obviously not being a tech stock, that one, for example, is trading at rather high valuations, both in absolute terms, when you look at, say, a price to earnings to growth ratio, as well as compared to its long-term prior history. So basically, there is there has been kind of a move uh, from investors in, into what they perceive as being very safe stocks, which basically means things that have growth, that growth being relatively bulletproof over the net, over their time horizon. That's you know obviously a lot of the big mega cap monopoly tech stocks fall into that category, but it translates into things like Costco as well. That's where a lot of the valuation pressures are. You don't really see valuation pressures in you know healthcare or finance or um, energy you know, mid caps or, or kind of like slower growing dividend type of, of stock. You don't really see a lot of valuation pressures there, but you do see a lot of these excesses in these kind of perceived less risky type of investments. Lynn, you've had some excellent calls in your past Macro Voices appearances relative to energy prices. Specifically, you called $70 is the likely low on WTI, I don't know, a couple months before it happened. And that level has really pretty much held ever since then. It's well over a year ago, I think, that you made that call. That's been the low. Uh, we're well off of that now, back into the 80s. But as we got up close to 85, it didn't seem to want to hold. And now we're consolidating sideways. Is that it? Is the the rally over, we headed back down to 70 bucks, or is this uh, maybe got some legs to the upside? So in the near term, I don't have a high conviction view on that. So I'd, I'd be purely speculating. One thing I've tried to do is position into uh, energy stocks that do well even at current prices. So if energy just continues to chop along, uh, they are cheaply priced for that scenario. They generate great free cash flow and payouts, and then they have that embedded option in them uh, should we get much higher energy prices. The longer we look out, the more bullish I am on energy because that's where you know more and more fundamentals matter, more and more supply and demand factor in. Uh, so I'm a long-term energy bull, no particular view about the next quarter or two. If we do get that scenario that I described before, Four, where U.S. economic data softens a little bit, and we see some cuts from the Fed. You know, is not particularly stimulative for the U.S. because all, a lot of that debt's already locked in at higher at, at lower rates anyway. And if it ends up stimulating some of those uh, dollar indebted global markets uh, and allows them to run easier policy and to expand more, that could be quite pro energy pro oil price, uh, energy bullish, because you could get a combination of a slightly weaker dollar index or at least a broad dollar index, and you could get more uh, economic activity and multi-year energy consumption out of a number of those highly populated markets where they still consume way less uh, energy per capita than we do. So even in that scenario where, where say, CPI comes in low or soft and labor markets uh, coming in soft, we would normally think of that as not being particularly good for energy, but to the extent that that happens in the U.S. and it allows for cuts, then it allows for potential booms elsewhere, which which results in energy consumption. On the other hand, if we get 
energy disruptions in any other scenario, and if if CPI stays uh, elevated and we don't get Fed cuts, then that, that obviously could put pressure on some of those markets I just talked about. But it's also potentially still good for energy uh, from U.S. demand and just over from from whatever might have caused those supply disruptions. So I, there's multiple paths forward for higher energy prices in the longer term. And my view is um, base case is range bound to up. So I wouldn't be surprised to see falling back into the upper 70s. I wouldn't be surprised to just advance from here into the higher 80s. There's a lot of scenarios that could move that either way. And the way that I'm just positioning it is to kind of view it as a cash flowing industry with a bunch of kind of call options on on much higher energy prices that I expect uh, in the longer term. Well, Lynn, I definitely agree with you there. I don't have any strong directional conviction either. Let's move on to something that is going to definitely affect that directional conviction, though, which is the Chinese economic recovery. So many people thought that really it was going to be all about China and its recovery and the reopening that was going to define the recovery of energy prices and so forth. Didn't go that way. What do you think is going on that uh, China's had the issues that it's had? Where do you think it's headed? What do you see in terms of the outcome. So overall, we're continuing to see weakness uh, in China's housing market uh, and overall consumer consumption. Basically, if it's kind of the mere opposite of the United States. In the United States, we have fairly weak industrial production, but fairly strong consumer demand. And on China, you see the other side of that, where all the, all the consumption stuff, that's generally weaker, whereas their industrial production has been absolutely on fire. Uh, in recent years. And so I, I expect that trend to probably continue for a while longer. Generally, what we see in highly indebted private bubbles, like private debt bubbles, is you see rotation from the private sector to the public sector. So, you know, in recent decades, Japan went through that where debt rotated from the um, private sector to the public sector. All else being equal, that was fairly disinflationary until it gets up to a very high level. In the United States, we saw that rotation starting with the global financial crisis, uh, where some of the private debt, at least as a percentage of GDP I'm speaking of, rotates toward the public sector. So you can have a scenario where even though absolute levels of private debt continue going up when denominating currencies that are being debased, um, their percentage uh, relative to, say, private sector assets or relative to, to GDP uh, start going sideways to down. And we're, we're seeing China go through a similar phenomenon now where, uh, you know, for years and years and years, they, they juiced up their housing market. That's getting sorted out. They're doing it in such a way that, you know, instead of it kind of all imploding at once, it's like this slow motion destruction of capital and malinvestment and debt. Uh, And so what we're not seeing is major stimulus directed at the consumer or urgent attempts to restart their economy. Um, So my expectation is probably that continues for some time longer, which is where consumption is is mild. I think it's it's, it's earlier signs of, of mild reacceleration. So consumer sales data out of China, to the extent that you can rely on it, has been a little bit better recently. And so overall, that probably going to continue to muddle along. So I'm never as bearish on China as the bears, and I'm never as bullish on China as the bulls. Another thing that I think has gone really under the radar for China is their auto sector. So in literally the past, call it three, three and a half years, their number of auto exports has hockey sticked. So they went from a very small auto exporter to, in a matter of years, being the the largest auto exporter in the world. And we don't see that in places like the United States, but you see it in places like Egypt or BRICS countries in general, developing countries. Um, that's where they, these like less expensive cars have really kind of taken market share. And all else being equal, that you know China's like export um, industrial competitiveness has some disinflationary pressures on the world because there's, there's all that kind of industrial capacity, all that supply side strength. Um, but what if you bring it back to the energy question for a second, filling the world with a bunch of uh, low cost vehicles that they couldn't previously afford uh, until they kind of reach these kind of lower levels, that actually opens up potentially a lot more uh, energy demand. As you see the marginal um, person in a lot of these countries upgrade from, say, a you know a moped to a, a small car. And so that's one of the long-term trends I'm monitoring is as as we continue to see bifurcation between West and East, you know, I think there's maybe too much emphasis on China's domestic economy. I think that's probably going to continue to muddle through. 
And one of the things I keep focusing on is how does China affect these other markets? And, and generally speaking, longer term, I'm pretty bullish on that relationship because I think we're going to see more and more of it, more cars coming out of China, coming into those markets, more and more bilateral trade. And on some categories, that can be disinflationary, like, for example, vehicle prices. But in other categories, like energy, that could be inflationary. Well, speaking of markets that are directly affected by China's activities, let's talk about precious metals next. Some people have speculated that it is China's uh, central bank buying that has been chiefly behind this massive rally that we've seen. Other people have said that has nothing to do with it. So what is driving the strength in precious metals, uh, gold in particular? Is it about central banks or is it about something else? And is it related to the other stuff you just described? So like a lot of things, there's usually more than one answer, uh, and that's true in this case as well. I mean, we do see, officially, we see central bank buying at a pretty high level, you know, in, in, in kind of East or BRICS-type nations. I think uh, something that doesn't get discussed enough is just private sector demand from the East. And so, if, you know, if, if you're a Chinese citizen and you see um, the housing market has not been doing well, the stock market has not been doing well, Gold is one of their go-to lower-risk investments or savings vehicles. And so I think whether you look at the government side, whether you look at the private side, there's a lot of demand structurally in the East for gold. And so the combination of, you know, say, U.S. sanctions and confiscation of assets driving a lot of countries to at least develop backup plans or have less reliance on the dollar and treasury market, that's obviously an ongoing variable. But as we see more and more West and East divide, Uh, I think gold is gradually reasserting itself as a neutral reserve asset that if the country custodies it, if the person custodies it, then it's harder to confiscate. I think it's reasserting itself into a a global kind of long-term savings asset and that that's that's probably going to continue for a while longer. And if we do – so if if you look at most projections, say the New York Fed, for example, they, they projected that they expect balance sheet reduction by the Fed to end next year. And you know, I think if we do get some rate cuts and we get an end to balance sheet reduction, that should be pretty bullish for gold, all else being equal. And so the combination of the geopolitics behind gold, the bifurcation between West and East, and then you know the fact we've just gotten through a very aggressive tightening cycle, we see a number of developed market central banks uh, trimming their interest rates a little bit. Even in a scenario where they end up keeping interest rates high, some of them will probably have to go back to balance sheet expansion just because of their fiscal situation if they want to keep their sovereign debt markets you know, liquid and functioning. All of that should be pretty gold constructive. Um, so I'm, I'm long-term bullish on the metal. Let's talk about the metal versus the mining shares. For the last several years, gold mining shares have badly underperformed a lot of people's expectations relative to the metal. Most people own gold mining shares because they're expecting it to be a, a vehicle that gives them leverage to the price of the metal. They expect to, uh, the, the, to get more upside on the, the stocks than they get from the metal. And the reverse has been true for several years, but just in the last few weeks, we're starting to see a little bit of life maybe coming back into the mining shares. Does that mean it's time to to rotate into the miners? Are they about to have a big recovery? Or uh, is, the, is the metal still going to continue to outperform? Where's the best place to be allocated here? So I'm, I'm moderately bullish on them. Uh, I think for most position sizing, I, I generally find gold itself to be a better risk-adjusted position than the gold miners, uh, which is kind of the opposite of my energy view. So in the energy sector, I do prefer to own the producers, whereas in the precious metal sector, I prefer to own the metals themselves. One of the reasons for that is that because I'm bullish on both gold and oil, and uh, energy is a is a big input cost to miners in general. That I, you know, for miners, you could get good numbers on the revenue side, but also high numbers on the expense side if you have gold and and oil going up together. So I, you know, I've been. I've been positioning larger in the metal itself and less in the miners, uh, although I do maintain a, a, a non-zero mining position, you know, should we get some sort of outsized moved in them. Generally speaking, that's just, it's a very challenging industry. And in any sort of very challenging industry where you know, the majority of them underperform what they're mining and a handful really, really outperform, that, that's an area where being a specialist uh, is particularly helpful. 
Lynn, let's talk about Europe next. Uh, needless to say, the, the first winter that we had during this war with Ukraine was almost a, a really, really serious energy crisis for Europe. Then the second winter of the war wasn't so bad. Uh, as we look into the third winter, what is it going to mean for energy? And what do you think in general about the European economy and the, the economic challenges they face there? So, I mean, that'll partially depend on any future disruptions that occur. Uh, my base case is not to see a, a spike necessarily just because of how much LNG has come online and they have those tools to deal with it. The darker side of Europe's energy stability is the uh, deindustrialization that they've gone through. And so, you know, Germany's historically been the, the manufacturing powerhouse uh, in the Eurozone. And they've had to shed some of their more energy intensive businesses that are no longer viable when you have less energy security and, and high average energy prices. And I don't really see that reversing in any sort of investable time horizon. I, I think, you know, if I was going to start or operate any sort of energy intensive industry, Europe would, would not be anywhere near the top of my list for where, where I would want to have that business. And so I think that that's going to continue to, in some ways, save Europe's grid, but harm their economy. And, you know, I, I, I just got back from Egypt. I was there like a month uh, and I've been watching their energy crisis kind of up front. And, you know, e Egypt itself is not a, a market that their energy is going to impact kind of global prices too much, but it is constructive for how other frontier markets or in some cases, even Europe could have an issue. So in, in, in Egypt's case, they produce natural gas domestically, but they also import it uh, from Israel and other neighbors. And then they, their goal is basically during the summer, they consume it heavily for air conditioning, whereas other, other months they don't. And so they have LNG facilities where they hope to export it. But the problem is that uh, Egypt's not been producing as much gas as they expected. And so they run into shortages both last summer uh, and this summer. And so then they get kind of rolling power outages. They literally don't have enough natural gas for their grid. They do have a nuclear power plant coming online uh, in a couple of years. That'll increase their electrical output by potentially 15%, but that's not coming online this year or next. And so they've had to um, basically do these rolling power outages where they, they kind of time different neighborhoods to be without power. And so that's the less extreme outcome, but it's, it's one that's still obviously very economically and socially disruptive. And there's all these like quirks that happen. Like for example, Egypt is, is designed to export LNG. It's not designed to import LNG. And so if it has a natural gas shortage, there are frictions there about how it solves that problem. They've had to uh, contract a very large vessel that does regasification for them because they don't have the infrastructure. So not only are they buying the LNG, they're renting the infrastructure in order to make use of that LNG. Um, and that this is one particular uh, example of an issue where if you don't take energy seriously, you can have pretty significant uh, crisis, both economically and socially. Uh, and it shows that energy is so intertwined where it's not as simple as, oh, we have a shortage, buy more. It's, it's also the question of well, how, how do you buy it? And if you buy it, what form do you buy it in? And you have to, you have to get the infrastructure you know, to be able to make use of it. And I think we're going to see more scenarios like that in other countries. And if we do see more acute energy shortages, something like that could strike Europe where you have just kind of periods of time where you know, not all the grid can be online at once. Uh, and while that's not an end of the world scenario, uh, it does reduce its productivity uh, and it increases uh, societal frustration. And then you get, in Europe's case, you potentially then get more um, outlier election outcomes and things like that that can eventually have other financial implications along the way. Lynn, a topic that's gotten a huge amount of attention recently is data centers generally and AI data centers in specific, and particularly the energy demands that they're going to create and how those energy demands are going to compete with other uh, users of those same energy resources. Where do you see all of this headed and what's your take on its, uh, on its implications for markets? Well, so that's another one of the bullish factors that I have for energy. Um, I like the fact that my bullish energy thesis doesn't rely on any one thing. There are a number of factors that together all paint toward a pretty bullish future on, on energy prices and overall energy demand. And AI uh, and, and the associated energy consumption there is no different. Much like how you know, we outsourced a lot of our physical labor to machines, 
there's a lot of mental tasks that we can and are outsourcing to machines as well. But all of that is energy intensive. That's that's a catalyst for uh, energy demand growth in the United States. Uh, you know, over time, it, even places like Europe can be impacted by that. And one of the things I've been focusing on is is say the difference between AI data center needs and say Bitcoin mining needs. Because obviously in recent years, Bitcoin energy usage is always, it's a political topic and it's, it's something that comes up. But people aren't really, I think, ready for the types of AI demand. Because when you look at, say, Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining is, um, it can tolerate low uptime, right? So it can tolerate, you know, being shut off. It's low bandwidth. So it can go into remote places where the stranded energy is and operate there. Whereas AI is specifically not really like that in most cases. AI generally wants low latency, high uptime. And so it wants to be closer to population centers and with very reliable energy. And so that actually does compete more with residential and industrial uh, electricity uh, than Bitcoin mining does. And uh, they can pay more because uh, in AI's case, more of the costs are in CapEx Whereas in Bitcoin's case, more of the cost is in the electricity, so that they're very sensitive to only paying the lowest electricity rates. Uh, and so basically, every fear that people had around Bitcoin mining wasn't really a thing. But some of those fears actually do apply to AI, that they can outbid to some other buyers and that they do want to consume energy in, in the kind of the same spot where we live and work. Uh, and so countries that don't get ahead of that, that don't manage their grid well, that don't make sure they have reliable energy, uh, are really going to fall behind in terms of productivity because they're going to have a ton of frictions. In an extreme case, you get like what I just described in Egypt, where there's just not enough power for all the things that want power. And so you have periods of outages, or in Germany's case, you have deindustrialization. That's the scenario that, that multiple countries have to be on the lookout for because there's always the risk of supply side disruptions. We've talked before about insufficient capex going into into new supply of some of these dense types of energy. But now on the demand side, you know, any any forecasts we had around energy demand, say three years ago, are higher now because of these new technologies. And so yeah, all of that is bullish, but all of that is 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 comes with pretty significant risks and frictions. Lynn, I'd like to share a new prediction of my own with the audience and get your reactions to it, because you're the best qualified person I know to uh, to comment on this. I'm going to make the prediction that the AI guys, the, the AI boys and girls uh, particularly, are going to get into the energy business. And the reason I say that is entirely out of necessity. What I think is going to happen is we're going to get to a situation where the data center growth trend is forced to stop. And the reason it will be forced to stop is because there will be brownouts and, and blackouts and so forth. And there will be a public outcry saying these data centers are, you know, we, we should be giving the power to the people, not to the data centers. They're, they're all owned by fat cats. And, of course, the fact that it's the, the people that are using the, the Internet that, that the data center supply won't even occur to anybody. They're, they won't put two and two together. They'll, they'll just blame the fat cats. I'm predicting that the AI crowd is going to recognize, hey, wait a minute, we're going to be put out of business if there's not more energy. And the only way to get more energy is for us to get involved because we're movers and shakers. We are entrepreneurs in technology and we know how to make things happen. And all they have to do is take a look at the nuclear industry and they will very quickly realize that what's going on is the technology to solve this whole energy transition problem with nuclear has been staring us in the face for decades. Decades, but it's not the kind of nuclear reactors that Westinghouse and GE and Rolls-Royce and everybody else want to build. It's a different kind of technology, and we need some technology entrepreneurship competence to be inserted into the nuclear industry to get it back on track. So my prediction is out of necessity, the AI data center guys are going to get involved in providing energy to the rest of society because that will be the only way for them to get more of it. What do you think, Lynn? I, I agree with that entirely. Uh, and basically, I think when you when you imagine a new data center being built, there's basically pressure on both sides. I think that you know as these take more and more energy, there, like you said, there will be people that don't want a new data center 
uh, in their backyard because they don't want the brownouts. You know, they want the benefits of being able to use it, but they don't want the data center near them. And uh, on the other hand, if you're the one paying for a new AI data center, uh, you want to be sure that you're going to have reliable power uh, in that area for for quite a while. And so you're going to be cautious around going into places that don't have reliable power, or you're going to want to bring your own reliable power with you. And I agree with you that nuclear is the obvious choice, especially newer nuclear technologies. And so I, you know, I continue to be structurally long-term bullish on uranium. And I do think that uh, in the years ahead, this is a pretty significant catalyst for a nuclear renaissance, both in terms of overall nuclear power uh, generation, but also, like you said, the types of technologies that are used, not just building the types of facilities we did decades ago, um, but building entirely new types of facilities. And I'm, I'm bullish on that whole space. I mean, there's frictions that can come along the way. Any jurisdiction that fails to navigate this is going to go through frictions because either their people are not going to be able to you know, access AI uh, as efficiently as places that do manage energy better, or they're going to be able to access AI, but then they're going to have energy constraints elsewhere. But as we get through those frictions, uh, I think it's very bullish for energy in general. And I think that that's, that is something we're going to see. And I, I think all the incentives line up well for those um, AI companies to make sure they secure their energy. And then in addition, they have a lot of influence and lobbying power to help bypass some of the frictions that we've seen in nuclear for decades. Uh, so I, th- I think all of that is, is, comes together to be pretty pro-nuclear. I couldn't agree more, Lynn. And and specifically what I'm predicting is right now we're in this phase where the boys and girls of data centers and AI haven't really figured out the nuclear landscape yet because it is fairly involved. Technically, you've got to go learn all about it and figure out the, the pieces. Once they figure it out, and you're seeing evidence of that already, they're trying to figure it out. You look at what Sam Altman is doing backing Oklo, which is a company that's almost on the right technology. They get it. They understand that building more water-cooled nuclear reactors is a stupid idea, that we need breeder reactors. Now, Oklo is focusing on fast neutron uranium breeder reactors. I think they ought to be focusing on thorium and molten salt. But you know, that's just my personal opinion on something. The point is they're doing the right thing on the level of recognizing that we need to stop screwing around with light water reactors and invest in breeder reactor technology that uses the fuel efficiently. But they're not quite on the right technology yet. I predict that what we're going to get to is there's going to be a, a an overtaking of the nuclear industry where all of the the dinosaurs of nuclear that are change resistant are about to get run over by a very tech savvy group of people who can very quickly understand where this industry got taken off track 40, 50 years ago and what to do to put it on track. And I think it's going to be a major revolution. We'll see what happens. In any event, before I let you go, Lynn, I just want to ask you to tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at Lynn Alden Investment Research, what people can expect to find at lynnalden.com when they go to check out your writings there and how they can follow your work. Sure. And thanks thanks for having me. Um, yeah, lynnalden.com, I provide uh, free newsletters and articles about various subjects, macro, digital assets, and, and energy uh, in particular. And then also I provide a low-cost research service um, that comes out more frequently and, and covers these things in a little bit more depth uh, so people can check out the various options there. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Lynn back on the show. Now, joining us again in the post game is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Lynn's picture saying, Looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil starting with the EIA inventory. 
EIA printed a gigantic drawdown of 4.9 million barrels of crude oil, Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down another 875,000 barrels. But the thing is, those gigantic crude oil draws were offset by equally gigantic builds on finished products, with gasoline building 3.3 million barrels and distillates building 3.5 million barrels. So on net, that's a build, not a draw, of 1.9 million million barrels of petroleum overall. U.S. production held steady at 13.3 million barrels, its plateau level. The crude oil drawdowns are really starting to get big now. But for now, the builds on finished products are making up for them. The question is whether the draws on crude are the beginning of a seasonal trend set to continue and whether the products will soon follow suit. Unless we get a break above $85 WTI, the chart still looks exhausted. But those drawdowns breathe some new life into the market. So let's see if it lasts. You know, Eric, I'm a little bit more optimistic about crude oil. I uh, think that the price action has uh, consolidated well above its 50-day moving averages, and the entire pullback was contained to $80, just the way that uh, we were looking for the price action to balance itself if it was setting up for a potential breakout. Now, we haven't got the breakout yet in oil, but as far as I'm concerned, technically, the chart is behaving. Now, uh, even if we did get a technical breakout, we're coming, we would come quickly into those April highs uh, near $86, $87 that could be the first resistance point. But at this stage, I'm giving the bulls the benefit of the doubt that they're going to get this uh, moving higher. Now, and let's move on to equities. I want to get Nick involved in conversation. Uh, Nick, we have the chart on the S&P on page three. Uh, what are the levels you're watching? Yeah, Patrick. So right now, spot price on SPX is approximately 55.90, and we have an implied move for the August 16th monthly OPEX of plus minus 150 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 5740 and the lower implied move is 5440. Right now we have key resistance at all-time highs at 5670 and key support at 5400. As I said last week, I'm inclined to think that we see some seasonality toward the downside into the August OPEX, somewhere around that 5300 area perhaps, and uh, I think we kind of chop around into the election as well. You know, it's funny you say the 5300 area because uh, that is where uh, the retracement zones lie of this uh, April to uh, July market rally. And more importantly, that also corresponds with those March highs. And so that would be certainly a, a, a logical place that if there was a correction where a potential support line could come in, if this is one of those typical 5% style market corrections. But what is interesting is that this market in general has been running since November. November. And so we've got a, a market rally that uh, is uh, going on eight plus months. And uh, typically, at some point, when you have an advance of this magnitude, typically uh, the market starts to exhaust itself. I mean, we're up almost 40% in, in 260 days. And so we're starting to see some of those signs and uh, certainly saw some reversal candles. But what was particularly interesting about last week's CPI number was the distinct trigger it caused to create a, a, a rotation. And uh, just to kind of put it into context, I have the market breadth on page four, which we were talking about how very poor the breadth was hanging around 50% uh, just last week. We jumped to 76% in just one week uh, as the, the breadth completely widened. But what was amazing was the divergence, which is that the equal weight S&P 500 in a week was up 5%. The Russell, which you nailed, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, was up over 10%, while the NASDAQ was down 5%. So we have this scenario where suddenly uh, there was clear sector rotation that kicked in. Now, uh, usually uh, this kind of uh, uh, extreme divergence where one is up and the other is down is not typical. Usually it's relative outperformance where uh, the NASDAQ does better than the one or the Russell does better than the other. The fact that we saw the one distinctly ripping higher while the other very clearly distributing is uh, is very unique and ask the question as to whether something like this is sustainable. And while I think sector rotation 
could be continued, I think that the indices will start to correlate, even if the small caps continue to outperform on a relative basis. And uh, the bigger question, therefore, will be uh, whether or not uh, we see the markets here go through a broader pause and, and reversion, or whether the, uh, the, the broadening of the market can keep the stock market sticky. The biggest obstacle, of course, is that on those market cap weighted indices, those um, uh, mega caps are just so huge and such a big component that it's hard to imagine the rest of the components being able to keep progressing these indices higher if those are correcting. And uh, and so I still think the MAG7 play a pretty big role in there. But last week, Nick, you, uh, you nailed that Russell uh, trade, uh, calling the Russell uh, long against the NASDAQ short. Uh, what's your thoughts here? Yeah, so on the Russell right now, I'm inclined to think that we see a move higher toward their all-time highs at around uh, 244. So last week we broke out and we're up about uh, 12% or so in, in just about five trading days, which is pretty interesting because we're seeing a lot of money moving from the mega caps into the small caps. And I've been thinking this would happen for the past few months. Uh, you know, I've been wrong for a bit, but now I'm, I'm right, I guess, right? So right now, I think we see that 244 area get tested up pretty fast on the Russell, meaning that there's about 10% more upside in the short term. That would take us to all-time highs. And beyond that, I think it's possible we push toward 260 in the next few months as well, as we see more rotation out of the mega caps into the small caps. All right, well, let's uh, move on to the NASDAQ, which has been down 5% in the last week uh, on page seven. Uh, what are the levels you're watching on the queues? Yeah, so on queues right now, spot price is approximately 483. And we have an implied move for the August 16th monthly OPEX of plus minus 20 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 503. And the lower implied move is 463. Right now, we have key resistance at all-time highs at 504 and key support at 460. As I mentioned last week, I thought that we would see some selling in the mega caps and we've already seen that start. I think we're gonna see some more drawdowns in mega caps as we see rotation into small caps. So right now I am remaining short via butterfly put spreads on the queues. And uh, I think I'm gonna keep that thesis on until the middle of August or so. All right, well, let's move on to page eight where we have the volatility index. And when you reflect back on the last eight, nine months, um, this 15 level has been the upper boundary uh, of uh, the trade range. So we certainly had a spike in volatility with this, a few days of weakness in the uh, market cap weighted indices and that caused volatility to come up to this upper boundary and this is like to me a pretty important level because uh, either this becomes a bigger correction and we see an april style spike up to uh, you know the 2021 level on the vix uh, or this is going to be the upper boundary of a quick five percent market correction and the buy and dip traders will step in here uh, what are the levels you're watching here on the vix so with the VIX at about a 14 handle, we can expect to see top to bottom moves on SPX intraday of about 0.8%. We saw yesterday the largest downside move we've seen in many months. And I think this kind of forebodes for more volatility ahead in the coming month or two into the September OPEX. Um, right now, insurance is still cheap. However, it is getting more expensive as we lead into that election event. And I think it is very prudent if your portfolio is correlated heavily toward the S&P to be hedging using either puts or put spreads or callers perhaps. So I want to move on to the U.S. dollar index on page nine. And uh, we were before last week's CPI numbers uh, hovering around 105, which was a pretty critical level in my mind. And uh, we really saw a distinct breakdown in the dollar in the post-inflation numbers that is now doing some significant technical damage. Not only have we seen a, a material rally in the yen as the U.S. dollar yen uh, has a mean reverted almost entire June move um, uh, blowing through Fibonacci zones like a hot knife through butter. Uh, but also we have uh, the euro starting to uh, break to a higher high. And um, the it, it's we obviously uh, don't see the results of the ECB just yet when we're recording 
recording this, but it'll be really interesting to see whether a bigger dollar correction is underway. Because in my mind, when the dollar is going through a weakening cycle, it tends to be a tailwind for commodities and energy and so many other spaces that generally have been lagging and underperforming. And so if we go through a, a dollar weakness cycle, uh, precious metals and all sorts of other assets could end up getting some tailwind and um, and seeing whether this trend persists is uh, certainly on my mind. And moving on to page 10, we had that gold futures chart. What are you guys thinking here? Well, we got a new all-time high much sooner than was anticipated from seasonal uh, trends. Normally, you'd expect seasonal weakness through the end of August or so, and then after Labor Day, things would pick up in the gold market. Seems we couldn't wait. So it'll be very interesting to see if we can hold above 2450 now and sustain uh, this new level or uh, if the market is going to retrace. But I think the, uh, the bull market is clearly back on. The cup and handle pattern still target it's 2725. That's 2725. But there's no clear time frame for when that should happen, because after all, that cup and handle was a 12 year long pattern. So needless to say, uh, you know, timing exactly how long it's going to take to play out for the completion is anyone's guess. Since the Z4 contract, the December 2024 contract is already above $2,500, thanks to the contango in the market, it already seems realistic to me that by the time of that that contract's expiry in late November, we could possibly be at that 2725 target level. Patrick, I'm very curious to know whether you have an upside target for gold in the intermediate to long term. In other words, uh, as a completion for that cup and handle formation that's been in play for over a decade now. Eric, the most obvious uh, upside target is uh, towards 2700 uh, but that's a, a more of a short to intermediate uh, target, something that could be even seen here in the third quarter of the year. Uh, the, uh, the bigger targets, when you're really talking about a breakout to all-time new highs like this, uh, could see this uh, easily head towards even 3000 but that would be something that would be a, a rally that could be seen into 2025, and I wouldn't use that as a, a a trading target for any short uh, to intermediate um, uh, trades. Uh, one way or another, gold has beautifully broken out to an all-time new high. But what is interesting is is that the breakout itself uh, didn't see the other precious metals totally follow suit, particularly silver keeps lagging a little bit. It would be really interesting to see uh, a nice confirmation to see that uh, the other precious metals all join the party. Then uh, when you see uh, gold Old equities participating. It really means that some flows are coming in here, and that would be a really good confirmation tool that this uh, breakout will stick. Now, on page 11, we have that uranium chart. Eric, what are your thoughts here? Well, the long-term fundamentals for uranium couldn't possibly be more bullish, and that story keeps getting more and more bullish every day. But the technicals have just turned from bad to worse. I think the reason why that's happening is probably that there's an informal buyer strike among the physical market participants, and generally it's quiet summer trading with not much physical market uh, activity and no metal traded on the physical market in most days trading sessions. The buyers are not the slightest bit concerned by fear of missing out and are just sitting back waiting for prices to return to the sub $50 level, which apparently many of them are confident is going to happen. Now, I'm convinced it's not going to happen, but it appears that they're going to try to wait it out anyway. Many of my favorite uranium mining share charts flashed right shoulders in head and shoulder patterns on Tuesday. Then they completed those head and shoulder patterns with downside breaks below their necklines on Wednesday. In many cases, that left those issues to close on Wednesday well below their 200-day moving averages. So we've got head and shoulders completions to the downside and closes below those key 200-day moving averages. Now, these are technical signals that are likely to beget even more selling in coming days. So I doubt that the bottom is in just yet. Buying this dip is going to be the buying opportunity of a lifetime. But as always when buying dips, trying to catch a falling knife is tricky business. So you have to have some discipline, particularly in terms of saving some dry powder, to buy even more shares at even lower prices if we get them in the future. 
So my call here is of the strongest possible conviction, and that call is that you want to buy the bottom of this dip that just started to break lower on Tuesday and Wednesday, and you want to buy it in size. Now, of course, the question, obviously, is, okay, if that's what you want to do, well, how much lower than the current level is that bottom going to be, and how long is it going to be before that final bottom comes? Well, that's always the hard part, isn't it? If I'm right about why this is happening, how long could still be weeks to months? If the physical market buyers are holding out for lower prices, the more we start to see lower prices, the more their conviction will increase and the less likely they'll be to abandon their price sensitivity. Now, I was already an aggressive buyer of uranium mining shares on Wednesday, and I'll be buying more shares at all the obvious technical levels below the current market. I have no idea how far this technical correction will run, but eventually fundamentals will take over and the bull market will resume. Remember, the name of the game is buy low and sell high. Low is what we have right now we're likely to get even lower before this bull market resumes. But this is clearly buying season, and we continue to grind lower, looking for the bottom of this technical correction in a raging bull market in uranium and all things nuclear. Yeah, we're going on a six-month correction uh, in uranium, and uh, the Sprott Physical has been bouncing around as a closed-end fund uh, at different discounts to net asset value, uh, and has been muddling along these lows. Uh, but what's more interesting to me is the fact that uh, we had some distinct selling in the uranium equities in the last few days. And it really seems like uh, some people are getting exhausted from uh, holding on to this uh, big picture trend. And they're certainly uh, rebalancing their sizings uh, and exposures. Overall, I get the bull thesis and it's gonna be uh, one that I still firmly believe will play out in the longer term. But on the short term, this distribution is very pronounced and not over. And so we're gonna have to see where the the short-term lows established themselves before uh, a new buy signal uh, really gets underway. Finally, I wanted to uh, just touch on page 12 on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, as yields now have broken the June lows, we continuously now are seeing the pattern of lower highs and lower lows as bonds are generally strong here. And uh, this uh, is, in my mind, uh, the path of least resistance for at least the remainder of this year. Uh, my big call was essentially that bonds have bottomed back in October and that we weren't going to see lower lows on the Treasury bond markets in this calendar year. That doesn't make me super bullish. I just simply think that the sell-off was uh, uh, far too intense and certainly now has established a new range. I think we could see still yields drop under 4% here uh, going into the um, uh, third and fourth quarters of the year and, uh, and that could be money made in this as the Fed starts cutting. We'll see uh, how this settles in. But overall, I think bonds are a good trade here. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, in this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview and the chart deck we just discussed here in the post game, including a number of links to articles that we found interesting. You're going to find this link and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. 
Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.